Last week was emotionally draining. Apart from events in my personal life, the world lost one of its wittiest, most charming comedians, and the murder of Michael Brown sent emotional pulses rushing through the hearts of Missouri residents and the veins of mainstream and social media. Those events somehow led me into a long discussion-argument hybrid on my channel's Facebook account. If that person is watching this, I know I apologize for that going on too long, repetitively, unproductively, and zealously, but I want to publicly apologize for it too. I really believe that she and I agreed with more than we disagreed with, and looking back at the pages of our discourse there, it really feels like we were simply talking past each other most of the time. I hate that. And the failure to communicate is every bit as much my fault if, as not more than what it was hers. It's a good thing from time to time to be able to openly admit that I can be just as stubborn, aggressive, emotional, and human as everyone else, even though I'm not proud of it. What seemed like an exhausting waste of time for both of us did at least leave me contemplating the surrounding issues more deeply in the wake of that tragedy that left a young man's corpse riddled with police bullets the weekend before he was supposed to start college. When such tragedies emerge, I think of just how far we as a society have come in some aspects and just how primitive we remain in others. The evolution of human minds and habits has been driven by the paranoia that kept our primitive ancestors alive in a very different time. When our species was young, those who assumed that anything that moved and looked dissimilar to them had a head start reaction time for fight or flight. Those who hesitated and inquired more about the potential threat of something new or unique were at an advantage on the rare occasion that it was something beneficial and an extreme disadvantage when it was something dangerous. There just so happened to be far more deadly threats rustling through the brush than helpful discoveries. When our command of primitive tools and technology allowed us to form growing tribes, that tradition of paranoia continued. Those who distrusted, avoided, and or annihilated neighboring tribes were more certain to avoid the potential danger thereof, whereas those who extended the olive branch to outsiders put themselves at risk to be victims of the more paranoid groups, despite the great potential benefits of allied tribes. I'd like to think that We've since evolved to understand the benefits of societal diversity and the dangers of such paranoia and isolation of the self. Sometimes it feels like we have, and other times it feels like we're back at stage one. After the Trayvon Martin trial over a year ago, Charles Barkley, of all people, was interviewed by CNN and mentioned he believed a key part of our country's problem with racism is that we don't have calm, serious talk about it. We only seem to engage the topic when something tragic like that happens when most of us are angry and compelled to defend our own tribes. I think his statement rings true and applies to whatever criteria humans use to the, in their prejudice against one another. Watching the response to Michael Brown's death on the news and in common person's reactions through social media has been truly disturbing. I doubt we'll ever completely purge ourselves of the deep grain tendencies for natural prejudice or tribal defense because they're part of who we are. If you pull a random crayon from a box and examine its color, something will come to your mind with which you associate that color. Whenever one human encounters another, the brain analyzes hundreds of things about that person to assess the encounter. Have I met this person before? If not, I need to scan them much more carefully. What gender is this person? Is this a potential mate? What sexual orientation can I assume this person has? How large is this person in proportion to me? Is the figure before me a potential threat, a potential opportunity? Have I learned anything from other people who look like this person that can help me deal with this person? What kind of voice does the person have? What kind of outfit? What do those clothes tell me about that person? Is makeup being worn? Is the hair carefully managed? Look at those shoes. How much money did that wristwatch cost? Is this person wealthier than I am? Poorer than I am? Does this person look smarter than I am? Look better than I look? Friendly, desperate, attractive, trustworthy? What's the skin look like? Dark, pale, tan, clean, dirty, smooth, wrinkled, dry? Is this person tired, alert, older than I am? Younger? Who does this person remind me of? Why? What does that mean? You may be the world's friendliest, most non-judgmental and tolerant individual, but all of these questions are perfectly natural for your mind to ask itself upon a first encounter. It doesn't matter who you are, your brain is going to ask those questions instinctively and you will be called upon to answer them through a combination of conscious and subconscious conclusions prioritized by your own biases, experiences, and personality. 
The extent to which you allow yourself to believe your initial conclusions and feel yourself qualified to judge that person is what's important. Do you really think that woman must have your best interest in mind just because her hair and skin color look similar to yours? Is that man really a threat because he has large arms, a shaved head, tattoos, and a skin color which contrasts yours? Is that man really likely to snatch your purse just because you saw someone with similar skin do that on the news last night to someone who looked like you? Is it fair to treat him accordingly? Is that cop really likely to shoot you because you heard on Facebook that one with the same skin color recently did that to a civilian that looked like you? Is it fair that you treat him accordingly? Is it worth what we compromise to act upon the very worst of our prejudgments just to play it safe, even if the data by which we arrive at these assumptions has been painfully tainted by a deliberately salacious media, or perhaps it's been inherited from a loving but ignorant family that we assume would only give us reliable information because they want what's best for us? When we let ourselves get scared, we start jumping the gun and pulling the trigger, usually figuratively and unfortunately sometimes literally. We put ourselves in danger of letting our passion make us commit egregious double standards. If a white man shoots up an elementary school in cold blood, he's an insane individual. But if a black kid robs a corner store without pulling a trigger, he just is one of those hood kids, gangsters, thugs. Get the white man help, but avoid the black kid and anyone who looks like him. They're not safe. Call the cops if you're seeing one in your neighborhood. Meanwhile, consider a story partially substantiated by video evidence of a Florida man named Roy Sherman, whose 22-year-old son with autism called his father after being pulled over. Mr. Sherman arrived, parking on the other side of the road to inform the police that his son has autism and to be present during their interaction with his son. The two officers commanded Mr. Sherman to leave his vehicle, and when he refused on the grounds he'd broken no laws, they forced him out of his vehicle physically and tased the man who has heart problems, forced him to the ground, handcuffed him, and allegedly tased him four more times in the back. Mr. Sherman is currently facing criminal charges for assaulting an officer and, resist and resisting arrest. The officers and Mr. Sherman were white men, meaning the officers must have just been assholes. If the officers were both black, just a reminder that black police officers do exist, some may have accused the officers of racially motivated injustice. If Mr. Sherman were black and both of the officers were white, the Michael Brown case informs us that legions of people would be crying for those racist cops to be brought to justice. After all, the only evidence that suggests the tragic slaying of Michael Brown was racially motivated is the fact that the majority black town he lived in had a majority white police force and Michael was black while the cop happened to be white. If we want to make any real progress as humans on a global or national level, we have to stop making excuses for people who belong to our tribes and hold everyone accountable. We also have to stop turning human issues into tribal issues. Police brutality is a human problem that we need to fix. It's not a problem that only affects American minorities, even if they do receive a disproportionate amount of that abuse. If you happen to be a white male telling yourself, oh, it'll never happen to me, then you're dooming yourself and your ilk because it very well may. If you happen to be a minority complaining to the majority that such injustice only happens to people like you, you've just misinformed them and encouraged them to distance themselves from the problem rather than realize it's a human issue and we should all be fighting it. Here's a hint for fixing it, by the way. In uh, Rialto, California, where the entire police force is now wearing body-mounted cameras, the use of force by officers declined 60%, and citizen complaints against police fell 88% in the first year. Our segregation of issues doesn't end with skin tone, though. Marriage inequality is a human problem. Its restriction reflects a prejudiced society we all have to live in, and it's not exclusively a homosexual issue because of that. You don't have to belong to a demographic to want that group to have the same rights, privileges, and opportunities you have. Sexual abuse, rape, and harassment are human problems. They are not issues in which either gender is exclusively victim or perpetrator. And when we attack those as human problems, we can do so far more accurately and less divisively. The last effect I've observed from retreating it to our tribal mentality is the rejection of empathy from those outside of immediately affected demographics. 
It's astonishing to me how often I've witnessed people claiming that a man can't possibly understand the struggles of being a woman, or that white Americans can never empathize with the plight of black Americans, or that someone who has uh, never known true poverty is unfit to understand the struggle of those born into it. This disgusting rejection of human understanding typically snowballs into a spitting match over what group has life the hardest and who can throw more guilt at whom and how many things we can reference from the past to prove that you don't understand my tribe and you never can. Anyone who's been exposed to modern hip-hop culture knows that a typical adrenaline shot for your perceived success, no matter how successful you really are, is to make it abundantly clear what a derelict and dilapidated condition you crawled to your current state from. It's fascinating listening to people compete over how hard their lives have been or who had the most disadvantages to overcome, especially when they attribute all those problems to a single demographic they belong to and assume that nobody outside that category could possibly feel their pain or have those problems or remarkably similar ones for any other reason. No two people ever have the exact same life experiences. And even here in America, just one country, there's a tremendous range of cultural differences that go into what your life is like and what kind of people with similar experiences may or may not understand about you. But empathetic people with widely dissimilar experiences can only understand you if you let them. A middle-class Hispanic boy growing up in suburban Massachusetts will not have the exact same experiences and therefore instantly be able to understand the life challenges of three other Hispanic children when one grows up poor in the Bronx, another with a speech impediment in New Mexico, and a third raised by a single dad in Colorado. Just because they share an ethnicity doesn't mean they have some magical connection, and there's no force field stopping people from outside that ethnicity or gender, etc., from understanding any one of them particularly well. There's nothing to be gained by blaming other people for not looking like you or coming from your location of origin and assuming that they can't possibly understand you just because they haven't lived your life. You're the only one who will ever live your life in the exact way that yours has been lived, so unless you prefer to be misunderstood by the rest of the planet that doesn't share everything in common with you, I suggest pushing away fewer people and embracing more. If we want to work out this problem and many others that it affects, we have to understand that the hard work and sacrifices of many on the way to this point have brought some significant and encouraging progress. We need to recognize that we still have a long way to go. We need to hold each other and ourselves accountable for our own actions and our reactions to each other. Most importantly, we have to decide if we want to be the ones who push social evolution onto its next logical progression or let our emotions and insecurities make us regress to our stifling, monotonous, stagnant tribes. I don't think it's a hard choice.